Dhabi, you know, was it a 14 hour flight uh, arriving yesterday. So, yeah. um, uh, and so Dave did his PhD in Southampton in England and then um, uh, 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 went to Amsterdam, thank you, to Amsterdam, and then to Tel Aviv. Right, yeah, for, for two years, and then to Abu Dhabi uh, for the remaining for, for the last six years. Um, and he'll tell us about uh, about black holes, how they appear, and how we can observe them. So very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matty. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the last time I was here was about uh, three or four years ago. Uh, so it's uh, it's great to see the new building, which is really really impressive and amazing. Um, so I am part of the NYU family. I'm in NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, I've been there for about six years now, almost exactly six years, and uh, a lot of things have changed because uh, the whole university is only 10 years uh, old, so uh, we moved to a new campus in the first year I was there, and it's a, it's a really nice campus, but it's obviously a lot smaller than here. Um, and just recently, we've been awarded uh, uh, some cash, which is <coughs> some funding to build a centre. So the CCPP now has a sister centre um, in Abu Dhabi, which is Centre for Astro, Particle and Planetary Physics, or CAP3. And probably if you came to this colloquium last week, Ian Dobstick and I have uh, uh, told you about Abu Dhabi as well. And uh, so first, uh, MYU Abu Where? Uh, <laughs> this, is our, this is our campus. So uh, it's, it's a very nice little campus. Uh, this is Sadia Island, which is in Arabic the Island of Happiness. So we're all very happy there. And uh, most of this is actually still desert, so there's not that much there, except for a few hotels and a golf course, but it's growing. Um, they do have a lot of aspirations, so for example, uh, uh, so this is NYUAD, and this is the Guggenheim, which is still to be built. So this doesn't exist yet, but they still like to make nice pictures of it. And um, the Louvre at Abu Dhabi does exist, and uh, Macron, the French uh, Prime Minister, came to open that a couple of years ago. So things are happening and it's growing and the city's um, up and coming. Uh, the Centre for Astro Particle and Planetary Physics, uh, this has just been approved in the summer for the first five years and hopefully we'll get uh, renewed after that. Um, it was just uh, founded two months ago, so it's a very young uh, centre. It's an, an alliance of faculty and scholars actively involved in research in astronomy, astrophysics, planetary and particle physics. Basically, we took almost all of the physics department and said, what do we all do? Let's make a centre on that and try to expand to other things as well. Um, so it includes faculty members from the physics and also the math programmes at MYUAD, um, members of the MYUAD Centre for Space Science, so you might not have heard of that at all. That's a few people that work on solar physics in, uh, in Abu Dhabi and uh, some links to um, the UAE um, vision of having a Mars mission and things like that. Um, and also some faculty from NYU, Global Network, specifically several faculty from um, uh, CCPP. And one thing I wanted to stress is that um, we're up for collaborations. We've got some funding to bring people to Abu Dhabi for uh, visits and things like that. So um, we hope to grow more links between uh, the NYU Abu Dhabi team in physics and uh, CCPP. Uh, so the goal of the centre is to work towards providing an answer to a series of fundamental questions related to the composition and evolution of the universe. So most of us are astrophysicists there. Uh, we've made up of four clusters, one which is the astroparticle physics group uh, headed by Francesco Arniado. Um, the second one is the Earth and Planetary Science with uh, Ian Dobbs-Dixon, who was visiting here last week. Uh, the third cluster is the Galaxy Components cluster, um, headed by myself and also um, Yossi Gelfand in Ginzor, which many of you probably know. Mm -hmm. Malibu Roberts, they're all part of the uh, Galaxy Components cluster as well. And the fourth cluster is Cosmology by uh, Andre Macho, who I believe visited here last year. Um, so uh, we're currently in the process of hiring a centre manager and an outreach person and uh, we've just advertised, uh, advertised a research fellow position. So this is the biggest um, growth in terms of postdocs or researchers um, that we're going to have anytime soon. We're going to have five positions each three years each. Um, so if anyone's interested in applying, uh, please do. Now I'd like to introduce uh, my team in Abu Dhabi. So I've got... Um, Used to have three, now two postdocs who have been working on some stuff. So I'm going to show some results and I'd like to thank them for uh, the work that they've been doing. So, hi Sweeney and Christina. Um, I've been working in Abu Dhabi for the last couple of years. And uh, Dan Bramich has been writing a pipeline which we're going to talk about during this talk. And uh, he had a two year position which was funded by a grant. Um, he's still in MYU Abu Dhabi, but he's moved to engineering. So he's, he's great at programming and his skills can be applied to many different things. So he's completely changed his field but uh, he's still helping with this pipeline that we're um, finishing off. And um, there's not many PhD students in Abu Dhabi. In fact, we have one and a few more coming this coming year. Uh, but we've had quite a lot of 
keen undergrads helping with some projects, so I'd like to thank these undergrads that have helped, and some previous students um, that have ended up in uh, places like uh, UCL doing a PhD and uh, an MIT, a few lucky ones that managed to go into uh, those places. So, what do I actually work on? Well, I'm interested in compact objects. Um, I might be speaking too quickly. Please interrupt me at any point if anything's not clear. If the jet lag gets to me and I miss some basic stuff, just please interrupt. Um, as you probably know, if you've got a low mass star, it lives for a long time and you end up with a remnant which is a white dwarf. If you've got a high mass star, then it becomes um, a blue supergiant and you can either end up with a compact um, object which is a neutron star or a black hole. So just to give you a physical perspective on these objects, a white dwarf might have the size of the Earth but the mass of the Sun. So that's a density of about one ton per cubic centimetre. So this is why these are called compact objects. Um, a neutron star is the size of a city, like New York, um, but the mass of one to two suns. So that's extremely compact matter. The density is half a billion tons per centimetres cubed. And uh, the physics of the interior of the neutron star is not very well understood. We're trying to understand these objects better. Uh, you might have heard of pulsars. If you've got a fastly spinning neutron star, which a lot of them are really rapidly spinning, um, sometimes you can have the magnetic field axis being different to the spin axis. And then you can get a flash of radiation like a, um, like a lighthouse when radio emission is um, produced on the magnetic axis and that spins around into your line of sight. Stellar mass black holes are roughly the size of the city in terms of the um, radius of the event horizon, but you've got a mass of uh, between maybe 2 and maybe 40 um, times the mass of the sun. The density theoretically is supposed to be infinite center if you, uh, if you believe in general relativity, you've got a <coughs> singularity in the center. Um, this is a very, very, very basic description of a black hole. This is a schematic of a spinning black hole. So you can have uh, the mass and the spin and the charge of a black hole um, and this is a depiction from a movie Interstellar, which is they actually used um, uh, computer simulations of what we actually think a black hole might really look like. Um, so it's quite unusual in the sense that Hollywood looked at the physics and, and said, okay, that's what it looks like. So um, this is like a zoo of the different masses of black holes that we know about. So in every, um, pretty much every large galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole sitting in the center. And that can be roughly between a million and a billion or higher um, times the mass of the sun. So you've got a single black hole, which is between a million and a billion times the mass of the sun. Um, then you've got stellar mass black holes, and these black holes form from single stars. And there's this kind of desert in the middle where there might be a few intermediate mass black holes. And these intermediate mass black holes are very interesting because they could be the progenitors of the supermassive black holes. So uh, some people are trying to identify these kind of objects. There's a few candidates, there's a few which are pretty good strong candidates for intermediate mass black holes. Um, from here these are nuclear, so they're in the center of galaxies, and on the left side these are off nuclear. Um, so for example HLX1 is still probably the best case of uh, inter intermediate mass black hole that's not in the center of a galaxy. And up until recently um, uh, the discovery of gravitational waves from merging black holes, before that uh, pretty much all of our empirical knowledge of stellar mass black holes has come from studying X-ray binaries. And these are binary systems containing a black hole. So you can see there's about 30 or so with dynamical um, masses, but there's a lot more where we haven't measured the mass, but we think there's a black hole there. Um, but as you can see from this graph, this is just from the first couple of years of the uh, uh, LIGO and Virgo mission. There's a lot more black holes that have been uh, discovered now. And this is the masses of the progenitors and the remnant that's, that's made in the merger. And you can see that they go up to uh, almost um, 100 solar masses, so they're quite large. And um, um, obviously in the next few years, with more detections being made, this is going to supersede the stellar mass population pretty soon. Will, um, will LIGO and Virgo be able to observe black holes in the 2 to 3 bin? Where I believe so. In fact, this year, because I had a quick look at the list from this year, but there seemed to be... Um, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, I think they seem to be not confirmed yet, but there's some which have constraints on the mass of order of like one or two solar masses, but the constraints are pretty weak. So as far as I understand, yes, uh, LIGO will be able to detect uh, low mass black holes. Ah, but I'm actually interested, I'm also interested in the two to three here, or the law. Oh, these, two oh, these ones, sorry, right. yeah. Because um, there's all these claims in there, but the mass measurements are all very 
week. Right. A single detection in there would be impressive. Yeah, yeah, do exactly. They are, do they have, can they do work at that frequency? I'm, I'm not sure. I think so. <coughs> I think the time scales would just be a bit longer, but as far as I understand, um, if it's close enough, they should be able to detect a, a black hole of, of that mass. But this, like, there's been a few which are, um, with, the, with the moment that's produced is uh, something like 80 or 60 times the mass of the sun. And uh, I believe that uh, we know how you can get um, single black holes that are up to maybe 30 solar masses if you have a, a progenitor star, a high mass star, which is maybe 100 solar masses. But higher than that, uh, maybe you need mergers before you can make um, uh, more than 100 solar masses. So if they did discover it, as you say, that would be really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had a similar question. So I mean, that was the big surprise with LIGO is that they were so massive. So then yeah. my question is the other way around from Hawks, actually, is um, is there any way we, we, could, have, we could have missed these really high mass systems um, that we don't see the Milky Way from EM, you know, X-ray binaries? Uh, is there a way we, have, we could have missed them? Is it kind of selection effect? Um, or might it tell us something really interesting about black hole formation, like having those two ways to, for, to, to probe the masses? Right, so versus X -ray binaries, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. It's interesting to think about. So we think that in, um, in X-ray binaries, you can naturally have an X-ray binary being formed if you have a high mass star that um, supernova and, and you have a, a, a high mass black hole there and it's still in orbit with the original star, which is a lower mass star, so it, la so it lasts longer, so it lives longer. Um, so we know, that, we know that that's how we think X-ray binaries are formed. But if you're going to have a, um, a mass that's higher than that, then if you need to have a merged black <coughs> hole to get that in the first place, then it wouldn't be in an X-ray binary, I admit it, unless you've got a triple system or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the question is, can you get like a really massive black hole in a, in a binary system? Um, maybe in a globular cluster, for example, you might be able to get such a system if it comes in later, but I think that's really unlikely, I, I imagine. Um, so yeah, we only can see the X-ray binaries in our galaxy. We can see a few outside the galaxy, but the ones that are further away, it's much more difficult to measure the masses. If you want to measure the uh, mass of these stellar mass black hole systems, um, you need to be able to take spectroscopy when they're very faint in quiescence, when the companion star dominates the light. And <coughs> they have to be fairly bright to do that. So we can't do them for, for the fainter objects, which is why there's not many systems on here. We've got maybe a few hundred uh, objects which we know of are probably black hole systems. Uh, X-ray binaries, but only 30 or so of those have got dynamical mass uh, constraints. And is that M82 X1, is that also a dynamical mass constraint, no. or is that no. a, that's a Eddington? So this one um, is quite a controversial claim. I think it was a Nature paper, so controversial. Paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, they inferred the mass from uh, the variability properties of the source. Mm -hmm. So if you believe their models, then yes, there's an intermediate mass black hole there. Um, but there's definitely some groups that question that. So, um, all right. So, what are X-ray binaries? This is an artist's impression of an X-ray binary. Um, as I say, you can have a binary star system. The high mass star blows up first, and you get a black hole. If it remains in a binary system, because it might not, it might blow apart. Then um, you can actually get feeding of the companion onto the, the compact object. So, this can be a black hole. It could be a neutron star in the centre there, and um, this can be maybe a star like the sun, like one solar mass. Um, a low mass X-ray binary, the low mass actually refers to the mass of the companion. So you can also have high mass X-ray binaries where you have a high mass star um, which is interacting with a compact object. If you have got a low mass X-ray binary, if it's a black hole, that can be maybe 10 times the mass of the sun and that could be one times the mass of the sun. Sometimes these systems are evolved where this is uh, filling its Roche lobe because it's uh, becoming a red giant. So in other cases, it can be just a main sequence star. Um, but in both those cases, it's filling its Roche lobe, so there's a point um, here where if the matter passes that, then it's gravitationally bound to the compact object. But it doesn't just plummet down towards the black hole, because the size of the black, black hole is the size of New York. So it's not, it's not going to hit that, it's going to miss. Um, and it ends up orbiting around uh, uh, the black hole. So matter builds up in the disk as it orbits around the black hole there. And um, the matter just wants to go around in a circle, it doesn't want to go all the way in because that would require a huge amount of energy. If you want to get the Earth to go into the Sun, you have to basically stop it in its orbit so it falls down, right? So you need to change the velocity of these particles um, to get them down to the center. And that requires a huge amount of energy. So matter builds up in the disk, um, but then it, it, it interacts with each other and there's viscous forces which makes it heat up. Um, and then the matter can slowly go to a smaller and smaller radii. And as it does that, it gets hotter and hotter. 
and you get uh, thermal radiation produced at higher and higher frequencies. And in the center, this matter is so hot that it's at a million degrees. And then you get X-ray emission from these objects. Uh, this is a computer simulation of an outburst that happens. So as the matter builds up in the disk, there's actually not much matter that goes into the black hole until an instability happens in the disk. And when that happens, um, hydrogen suddenly becomes ionized and you can get a bunch of matter just uh, collapsing towards the center <coughs> and, uh, and you get an outburst. And when you get an outburst, um, the luminosity of these objects becomes much, much, much brighter. And uh, this is a um, just little animation of the broadband spectral energy distribution of one of these objects. So what you're looking at is the log of the flux density, so that's how bright it is, against the log of the frequency here. And this is X-ray emission taken during an outburst of a black hole transient. Uh, this is optical, this is infrared, and this is radio. So as you can see, the source gets brighter when it goes into outburst, and then it gets fainter near the end, and this can take several months. Uh, but also the X-ray spectrum changes quite a lot. So when you get um, a power law like this in the spectrum, that's coming from really hot plasma close to the black hole. It's not coming from the disk, it's coming from some optically thin, uh, very hot plasma that's producing comp Comptonized emission. And then uh, the inner part of the disk uh, is much softer, so this is more like a black body spectrum. So when you see a steep uh, spectrum like that, that's the inner part of the disk. Um, and sometimes during an outburst, the inner part of the disk can come really close to the black hole, and then you can see it dominates the X-ray emission. And uh, if you point an infrared or an optical or radio telescope at these objects, you can detect them as well, but you don't see the same thing. So um, the optical emission comes mostly from the accretion disk, but not from near the center, from further out where the temperatures are lower. Um, and radio emission comes primarily from these jets. So some of the matter that goes towards the center near the black hole, some of that matter, instead of going into the black hole, gets launched into these jets that travel away from the system. And it turns out that these jets can be um, quite relativistic, so they can travel close to the speed of light. Um, and you have uh, electrons and positrons that are uh, whipped up by magnetic field lines and, that, and get accelerated away from the system. So that's one way of getting rid of the angular momentum problem, or you know, the matter needs a lot of energy to go into the black hole, so instead of going into the black hole, some of it gets ejected out along the poles. So um, why do we want to study these objects? Well, one question is, um, how does accretion work in strong gravity? We can't create a black hole in the lab, or at least hope not. Uh, so we can study these black holes to see if general relativity really works. And we can see effects that are predicted by general relativity, such as frame dragging and um, the stretching of um, emission line profiles in the X-ray uh, spectra and things like that. Um, I'm quite interested in the jets and how uh, powerful they are and the properties of those jets and the how they're launched. So the second half of my talk is going to be focused a bit more on the jets. Uh, but first I'm going to discuss about uh, the general outburst properties of these things and what's interesting about uh, uh, the outbursts. So the jets are actually the only component of the system that we can physically resolve with telescopes. So if you, if you point a radio telescope at these objects during outbursts, um, if you have very light, long base inter, uh, interferometry, VLBI, you can see individual blobs moving away uh, and you can measure their velocities and see how their flux changes. So we know that there's definitely jets there. Sometimes there's um, blobs that come out quicker than other times. Um, so uh, they're quite in analogy with uh, the AGN jets that you find around supermassive black holes. So this is a very basic uh, schematic of um, the region close to a black hole, you can have the, um, the disk here, and that can be at a temperature of um, peaking at 0.5 <coughs> keV, for example, in the X-rays. And this is the innermost stable circular orbit, or ISCO, which is the, um, uh, the closest uh, stable orbit around a black hole that you can have. Sometimes the disk can come very close to a black hole to, to this ISCO region. And you also have a power law <coughs> component in the spectrum from a cloud of plasma um, that's, sometimes it's depicted as above and below the disk, sometimes it's depicted as between the disk and the black hole. So the configuration of this uh, Comptonized hot plasma region is debated. And uh, so you get hard x-rays from this component and you get soft x-rays from the disk component. And these are some of the brightest x-ray sources in the sky when they go into outburst. Um, the disk is described by multi-temperature black body spectrum 
and this power law component uh, can dominate the X-ray emission at the beginning and the end stages of outbursts. And this is a little picture of uh, some real data. That's the soft component and that's the hard component in the X-ray spectrum from a few up to 50 keV. So during an outburst, um, we have a pretty good picture now of how black hole outbursts happen. And if you take uh, measurements of the X-ray flux and the X-ray spectrum, uh, and you see how it changes with time, you can make a diagram like this, where this is the X-ray hardness, or you can imagine it as the, the hard component versus the soft component, so the ratio of those two components. At the, begin at the beginning of an outburst, the source gets brighter, so this is um, flux or intensity on the, uh, the y-axis. So the, the object gets brighter, and this can take a few days or a few weeks. And then uh, at some point, uh, near the peak of the outburst, the spectrum changes completely to become a softer spectrum. And we think that's because the disk is coming very close to the black hole. So before that, the inner region um, of the accretion flow is coming from this power law component. And after that, uh, the disk comes to very small radii around the black hole, and it gets softer. So this is soft um, emission coming from the disk, and this is hard emission coming from the power law component. And then it gets fainter and goes back to this hard branch and goes down to quiescence. And this loop seems to happen in almost all the outbursts that we see from black hole transients. Sometimes they get brighter and they don't reach this point and they just get fainter again um, on this hard state branch. So we describe these um, outbursts as having a hard state and a soft state. And in the soft state, the accretion disk is producing the X-ray uh, emission and in the hard state, the power law is producing uh, the X-ray emission. Sorry, just a completely basic question. So hard means higher frequency. It's a frequency. Yes, yeah. yeah. We're actually talking about like a color of the X-ray spectrum. Uh -huh. So a hard state means that um, there's more hard X-rays or higher energy X-rays right. compared to the soft state where there's more soft uh, <coughs> or lower energy X-rays. And the explanation for why it gets softer at that point is because what? It's falling closer to the horizon and then... <coughs> Yeah, so the disk, um, the disk is the soft component, mm -hmm. and we think that the disk is coming very close to the black hole, so it becomes hotter, and then um, the component which produces the power law is disappearing. Okay. So the disk gets brighter and the power law gets fainter. Okay. So it's the ratio of these two the components okay. switching, okay. essentially. Um, What's the overall time scale for this uh, loop? So that could take <coughs> a few months or maybe a year, something like that. So these objects are quite useful in that we can see um, things happening in real time on human timescales. So we can actually match up um, AGN to different parts of this diagram. If you take a particular AGN, like a low luminosity AGN, it's actually equivalent of a hard state X-ray binary in some ways, um, with a steady uh, jet that's being produced uh, and hard X-ray emission. Whereas um, um, a high luminosity quasar is more like a soft state X-ray binary. So the configuration of the accretion flow can be compared to supermassive black holes. <clears throat> and do you think that the supermassive black holes are also doing a loop like this, just much more slowly? That's a great question. We don't know, but maybe. Um, so there's some evidence that um, there's periods of activity of AGN. So we can see like in X-ray images or in clusters, there are waves of um, um, expansion of uh, uh, gas that's uh, mm -hmm. expanding out. Uh, and that might be because of periods of aging activity, period, yeah. but we don't know if they actually trace out the same uh, loop as far as I know. And, and so this takes something like a year, and then does it immediately cycle again, or does it stay quiescent for a while? Or? So most of them um, stay in quiescence for a long time. So uh, a typical X-ray binary might spend maybe uh, 10 or up to 50 years or so in a period of quiescence where matter is slowly building up in the disk, and then it suddenly goes into outburst, and the rise time can be maybe a week or a month. Uh, and then the whole, uh, this, this period, all the way around here, can take uh, about a year, something like that. But it depends on the source. Some sources are um, kind of always in outbursts, so they are persistent sources that remain in this part of the diagram for most of their life. Um, and other sources just um, are in quiescence for a long time and then have a short uh, outburst. And there's a few which have continuously outbursts. So this particular object, um, uh, that's my next slide, uh, this particular object goes through this loop every few years. You can see data here from 2002 to 2003, 2004, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So every couple of years it goes around this loop. Sometimes it just goes up and down here. Sometimes it makes the transition across. So we call them state transitions when they go from the hard state to the soft state and then back to the hard state.
Now one interesting thing we're trying to understand is um, what does the jet do? Well, during this hard state it turns out that there's a jet that seems to be produced all the time. So there's continuously particles going, uh, escaping from the system. But when it goes over to the soft state, this jet disappears. And we think it's because uh, in the soft state this disk is very close to the black hole and the region where the jet's being produced <coughs> disappears. So in the hard state, this hard power law component is probably the, the base of, of where the particles come from that go into the jet. Um, and that region collapses when it makes a transition to the soft state. Um, so there's no jet produced in the soft state. So I had a question about the soft state. So when the <coughs> um, accretion disk gets very close to the black hole, close to ISCO, right? Yeah. So that measurement of ISCO, given the mass of a black hole, can you tell you about the spin, right? Can yes. Correctly? So is that... Is, do people look into that? Oh yeah, they yeah, yeah. So um, there's there's quite a lot of groups that are trying to measure the spin of black holes by um, waiting until the disk is really close to the to the black hole, so it's at the ISCO, and then it can get further in if it's a highly spinning black hole, um, and so they can measure the temperature of the disk and measure the radius of the disk, um, and there's some. I mean, it is model dependent. That's the problem. So uh, so if if you can measure, if you've got very good data and you and you apply uh, a good model to this, then you can measure the, the spin of the black hole. So what are the numbers? <coughs> Do you know? So, yeah, so... Can I find more? The ones you believe. <laughs> <laughs> like highly yeah, no, or it, low it, spin, because that's important for you know, GRBs. Right. Of them, and we just heard last week, um, or no, this week, uh, from our Astro Seminar speaker on stars and their lives, is that they should be actually slowly rotating. Um, Interesting. From other words, like Hilo seismology. And, yeah, so... Astro seismology and so forth. So, so that would be interesting to, to look yeah. at the, the spins of the, the remnants too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So over the years there has been a lot of controversy in this field because um, it's very difficult to um, know all the caveats involved with making these measurements of the spin parameter. Um, but the ones that seem that people seem to be agreeing on are actually quite high. So some of them are between 0 0.9 and 1. Uh, but there are some other ones where there's agreement that it's 0 0.5 um, <coughs> spin parameter. So it looks like there's a distribution, but um, yeah, I'm not sure how much we can believe these measurements. So there's definitely some in the past which are not very believable, but the more recent ones where they've used more than one method and got the same result, they're probably pretty, pretty concrete. Um. So how and why do outbursts happen? Um, there's probably more than about 10 to the 5 or maybe 10 to the 6 black holes in our galaxy, but we can't see them because they're black holes. Uh, unless they accrete matter. So that's why X-ray binary is interesting because you've got a companion star feeding onto the black hole and then we can identify that it's actually there. There's a model called the disk instability model um, which predicts that outbursts are initiated by a thermal slash viscous instability in the disk. So in quiescence, that's the period between outbursts, these things are, are very faint and actually very hard to detect. Um, there's a cold disk which fills up with matter from the star at a pretty constant rate and then at some radius in the disk, the temperature rises when it becomes unstable, um, high enough to ionize hydrogen, and then a heating wave travels through the disk, and that's when matter can go to the inner regions and start an outburst. And these are some predictions about um, the, the mass accretion rate onto the black hole with time, um, the magnitude in the optical, and the mass in the disk um, <coughs> over several years. So you can see they're very faint, um, and then suddenly there's a high uh, mass accretion rate, and then it gets um, lower, and that corresponds to an optical magnitude here. And this optical magnitude is coming from the, the disk. So we expect that the disk gets uh, much brighter by maybe uh, up to 10 magnitudes or so during outbursts. Uh, so we think that at the beginning of an outburst, the optical flux rises, and then heating fronts propagate through the disk, and you get X-rays when that heating front reaches the central regions. And that means that um, there's a, there should be a delay between the optical and the X-rays. So if you take optical monitoring of these objects and X-ray monitoring, um, if you're able to see when the outburst starts in the optical and starts in the X-ray, you can test this, um, this model. So the instability starts somewhere in the inner disk, but to date, no observations have constrained this due to the lack of data during the initial rising stages. So historically, the problem is that we only spot these uh, outbursts when they get detected by an X-ray or sky monitor. And there's uh, currently MAXI um, on the International Space Station and the BAT instrument on the SWIFT satellite, 
they can they, they scan the sky every day or less than a day um, to look for new X-ray sources. And if one of these objects is uh, detected, then it's already in outburst. It's already reached maybe 10 to the 36 ergs per second, which is fairly bright. So does the optical really rise before the X-ray? How are outbursts triggered? Um, where and how exactly are uh, Lemus X3 outbursts triggered? So this kind of demonstrates the problem. Uh, there was, for example, a new black hole system discovered in 2010. We didn't know about this object before. It got detected uh, by the Maxi satellite, and this is the light curve of the object. So this is um, over about 600 days. This is the X-ray flux on a log logarithmic scale. And the first detection by Maxi was around about this flux level, which is only about one order of magnitude below the peak of the outburst. Um, and then it faded. Uh, we couldn't observe it during this time because this, it was too close to the sun. Um, but we saw the, the tail part of the outburst here, and it had this mini outburst or reflare, and then it went down to quiescence. So you can see this is the level of quiescence for this object, which is very faint. And um, the new outburst was detected almost six orders of magnitude above the quiescent X-ray flux level. So we have no idea what happened before it reached that point. We don't know how quickly it, ri it was rising in the X-ray. Uh, we don't know what the optical was doing because we didn't know about this object before um, it was discovered. It so that's not archival data. But <coughs> SWIFT doesn't have enough archival data that you could find. I it. believe not. So there might be... So. <coughs> Um, ROSAC can't reach these levels, so mm -hmm. I think there was no X-ray data before um, this outburst. Uh, but there's definitely limits on, on the luminosity, so if it did have an outburst uh, in the last 20, 30 years, we probably would have known about it. Mm -hmm. So these outbursts can be described by um, fast rise exponential decay, or FRED outbursts. So the rise time may be something like a week, but they're not measured very well. And then it can spend several months decaying and going towards quiescence. During outbursts, they reach close to the Eddington limit. That's a luminosity limit imposed by radiation pressure. So we know that they can't get much brighter than about 10 to the 38 um, or so ergs per second in terms of luminosity. So one thing we've been trying to do to get around this problem is to monitor these systems in the optical with uh, um, the Las Cumbres Observatory. And we started with the two uh, Fox telescopes. These are some of the first completely robotic telescopes uh, in the world. So they're not, they're not the biggest telescopes in the world, but they can detect these X-ray binaries even when they're in quiescence. So um, since I was doing my PhD in Southampton like 14 years ago, uh, we started a project there where we started monitoring uh, X-ray binaries with these optical telescopes, and we haven't stopped since. Uh, now we have about 50 X-ray binaries that we're monitoring with these telescopes. Um, about half of them are regularly detected in quiescence. Some of them are too faint to detect in quiescence, but we can still monitor them to see when they, when they do get detected, that means an outburst is happening. These are fully robotic telescopes and Q-scheduled. We typically use um, three filters or just one filter if they're faint. Um, and this is optical observations. We monitor them about once per week when they're visible. And we can increase the frequency when there's an outburst. So. Tracking the X-ray variations of X-ray binaries in quiescence is generally not possible. So if we wanted to do this project with an X-ray telescope, we would need like um, 10 kiloseconds or, or more with Chandra every week on every X-ray binary, which is never going to get approved by NASA. Um, but if you can do it with a 2-meter telescope, then, uh, then why not? So optical monitoring provides the best means to measure mass accretion rate variability between outbursts. Now, um, about 10 years ago or so, the Fox telescopes became part of the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope Network. This is uh, with the headquarters in California. They've got a bunch of one meter telescopes in, um, in Australia at Siding Spring, in uh, Sutherland in South Africa, in uh, Chile, and the two meters there in Hawaii, and there's a one meter in Texas as well. And uh, there's new telescopes in this network coming online. There's a one meter in Israel and two one meters in, uh, in, in Tibet. And there's also a bunch of 0.4 meters coming online uh, as well. So this network is designed for all kind of transients. Uh, the idea is that if there's a source that you want to observe 24-7, you can actually do that by using uh, these different telescopes. And they've got the same setup on all these telescopes. So you can put in a request, say, I want to monitor this object twice a week for the next six months. <coughs> and the, the, schedule, the scheduler will decide which telescopes to use, whichever 
um, timing the schedule for the telescopes. And if, if one telescope location has bad weather, or if one telescope doesn't work, then they can change it to a different telescope. So it's quite a powerful network. Um, Dave, how much does a one meter telescope cost? How much does it cost to build, or? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not sure, actually. Um, it costs they're getting, a lot more definitely to pay getting cheaper. To it, it, it depends on how yeah. it costs. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like millions, yeah. tens of millions, less? It's, less, it's millions, millions or less. Okay. So I believe that... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it comes from the camera, right? So, you know, it's in a, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 hardware is easy sometimes. Kind of. <laughs> so one, one thing I do know is that, um, <coughs> like, more than one meter, they are specialized telescopes. Um, less than one meter are, like, um, manufactured uh, uh, telescopes that you can get off the off the belt, if you like. Um, so one meter is kind of the limit of that now. So I believe that you can pretty much have a company sell you a one meter. So the, the, the prices are going down, I believe, but uh, I'm not sure the numbers exactly. Um, so the idea of our project originally was to monitor low mass X-ray binaries and outbursts, track optical evolution on day-to-year timescales. I'm going to come back to uh, later about multi-wavelength campaigns during outbursts and why that's interesting and useful. Um, uh, we can also study these systems in quiescence. Uh, we can look at orbital modulations of the companion star and look for accretion activity between outbursts. And hopefully, we can try to spot outbursts at their early stages um, and identify um, uh, signatures when an outburst is about to start. So this is an example of one of our light curves. This is GX59 minus 4, which is a black hole system. And uh, it has quite regular outbursts. And this is our optical um, magnitudes of this uh, source during a few outbursts. Um, so we have guaranteed time through the Fox Telescope project. Um, this is a PI's Paul Roche and Fraser Lewis, who have been working with uh, since 2005. They're based in, in Cardiff in the UK. And they've got um, guaranteed time on, these, on this network for education and for research as well. So they get school kids to use these telescopes as well. Um, and then uh, we've been also buying time through NYU Abu Dhabi. And this summer, we decided to do an NYU global buy-in with um, uh, Mariam Modas as well. Uh, so Mariam and myself and um, Mallory Roberts, uh, Joseph Gelfan and Injin Zor decided to put in a certain amount of money to purchase time on this telescope network. So historically, people haven't been buying time, they've been writing proposals. Nowadays, uh, telescope use is becoming a, a business, and you can purchase time. So for example, it's like uh, $300 an hour on the, on the one meters to get imaging. Uh, so this is an example of one of our light curves. Uh, there was a new black hole system that was discovered last year. This is Max CJ1820. And uh, it was discovered at this point when it was getting brighter. And all these colorful data here are our optical uh, coverage with the Las Cumbers Observatory uh, network. And the gray and the black data are X-ray monitoring from all sky monitors. So there's two examples here of the beginning stages of an outburst that we spotted with our uh, network. So there's a neutron star X-ray binary called Aquila X1 which has fairly regular outbursts. This is the magnitude in quiescence. Uh, this is in the I band, and the blue is in the V band. And it, here you can see that it started to get brighter. So we can spot the outburst happening. Um, this black and gray data are showing the X-ray light curve. And we don't see the X-ray rising until about a week after the optical started rising. So that's nice. We get a delay of one week. But the problem is, these data are coming from X-ray or sky monitors. And we, we have a sensitivity issue where we don't know when the x-rays actually started coming out of quiescence. So even in these cases, we do see a delay between the optical and the x-ray, um, but we don't know exactly when the x-rays started getting brighter. This is a black hole system, SWIFT-J3057. We can see that uh, it's not an outburst there, and it is there. And in this particular system, the, it didn't actually get that bright in the x-ray at all, and they didn't get picked up by an x-ray or sky monitor. There's only one dubious... Uh, uh, detection there by Maxi. So, um, so this is also showing the importance of optical monitoring. Sometimes we can't detect the outburst even in the X-rays. Do you know what I mean? Is it? Do, are you just looking at a, like a hot continuum in the optical? Like, are there features? Like, what does the spectrum of something like that look like? Right. So the optical spectrum, um, it is a continuum, which is the thermal emission from the disk. Um, there's very broad, um, prominent uh, hydrogen lines. So H-alpha is a good diagnostic of an X-ray binary in quiescence. 
So you can have quite high uh, equivalent widths of these lines. Um, actually, one of these sources, we managed to get spectroscopy at the beginning stages and we saw a massive H alpha line which was indicating that it was just starting to go into outburst as we uh, took that spectrum, but we were quite lucky with that one. So um, one thing that we would love to do if we could would be to take regular spectroscopy of these systems, but they're quite faint, so we can do photometry very easily with, these, um, with this network, but if you want to do spectroscopic monitoring, there's only a few systems where they're bright enough to do that um, with small telescopes. <coughs> um, so this table just gives you an example of um, like the first, the date of the first X-ray detection and the first um, optical detection and then the days between them here. So for all these different systems that went into outbursts between 2007 and 2017, um, this is the number of days that we detected it in the optical before the X-ray. So for most of them, um, we, we do detect them before the X-rays. The problem is, it's a bit embarrassing, up until recently we haven't had a real-time pipeline to, to look at our data. So we've got 40 objects we're looking at and I've been uh, looking, at the, looking at the sources that are interesting, but not all the objects because most of them are in quiescence for 40 years. Um, so we've actually missed some of these outbursts, and so there's been, like, there's been a, uh, an astronomer's telegram on ATEL from the X-ray community saying we see a new outburst of an X-ray transient, and then we look back at our data and we say, oh, we detected that two weeks ago, but we didn't know about it. So we're dealing with this problem now by making a real-time pipeline for these data, which I'm going to talk about. There's a minus 18 in that chart. Yeah, uh, where's that? Uh, oh yeah. So does that is that one where it came out in the X-ray first? Because that's interesting. That's I mean, you have a strong argument that it shouldn't. Yes, I think I, I can check, but I think this one we didn't have very good optical coverage. Mm -hmm. So, then so it might just be a mistake. But it's interesting how uniform yeah. it is that you do get the delay in the correct sign. Because my that's experience true. is there are very few things in astrophysics that reliable. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. And um, so there are some biases in this table uh, because there's some, sort of, some sources that are more difficult to detect yeah. in the optical, some sources we're not monitoring. Um, and, and this one, probably we didn't have data. So there's a star there. I'm not sure why. Oh, this was, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. But, uh, oh, no, that's, that's, that's this one. Okay, this one is um, the X ray detection was with PCA, which is more sensitive. Um, but yeah, I don't know what the reason for that was. Uh, so occasionally now, we're getting to the stage with all these um, optical transient surveys that these objects are starting to be discovered in the optical before the X-ray, even when they're not known before. So there was a new um, black hole system, Maxi 1820, discovered last year, and the Assassin um, survey actually discovered the optical rise before the X-ray was detected, even though this source wasn't known before. And uh, this source became so bright, it's quite a close by black hole in our galaxy, that it reached about 12 magnitude. And um, some of our data here are coming from the Al Sadim Observatory, which is a small telescope in, um, in Abu Dhabi. It's not in the city, but it's out in the desert. Um, there's an Amirati guy, uh, Tabet, who is an amateur astronomer. He's a very keen guy, but he doesn't know much physics, but he's, he's really keen on doing this. And he built his own observatory and he hired a few people to basically take observations. And it's been open to the public for the last few years. Um, and they ended up taking, uh, last year, more than 4,000 images for us for this uh, X-ray binary. And uh, it got some local media attention. So in the national newspaper, there's this article about Emirati Astronomer collaborates with MYUAD on black hole research. So that was a nice kind of local uh, collaboration that we initiated. The guy that owns a couple of restaurants, right? Yes, yeah, his, his food's really good. So <laughs> he's got a restaurant, and uh, we, we go there with a bunch of students so we can show them these telescopes, and they provide this wonderful dinner for us. And the, uh, <laughs> um, so, this is an example of a long term light curve from one of our objects. This is V404 Cygni, uh, it's another fairly close by black hole system. Uh, this is our optical monitoring, and most of this variability is real, but it's coming from the modulation of the companion star in quiescence, and then it had a very bright outburst that was quite short uh, over here. And if you look at our data, um, this is the range of data for quiescence, and then just before the outburst happened, there were these two, two or three points which are brighter, and again, there's about a week delay between that rise and the first X-ray detection. So the seven-day X-ray delay after the optical is consistent <coughs> with the viscous time scale in the disk, so that is, agrees with the model. Uh, but we don't, again, we don't know exactly when the X-ray started to brighten. 
and this just shows the, the modulation of the companion. This is folded on the period, which is a few days, I believe. Um, and some of the points here, the red ones are the ones just before the outburst, and the blue ones are during the outburst. So I'd like to introduce you the X-ray binary early warning system, or XB News. Um, so we basically received a grant to write a pipeline to um, analyze our data in real time. So um, I hired a, a coding expert, basically, who um, has done photometric catalogs for exoplanets and stuff like that. His name's Dan Bramich, and he wrote this fantastic pipeline. Um, the pipeline interrogates the LCO data archive several times per day. We can do about once per hour or less. It downloads the data from our target list. Um, it uh, flux calibrates the data and checks for fl flat reduction errors. Um, it produces light curves in near real time and puts them online. And it's going to alert us when there's a new outburst happening. So it's at the, it's at the final stages of uh, making this pipeline right now. And it's also reduced all of our 13 years of data. And we're going to make this pipeline publicly available on GitHub. Um, and he's written a pretty good detailed user manual for this as well. Uh, we will then be able to alert the community of a new outburst at the very early stages via an ATEL. So this gets rid of the problem that we look back at our data afterwards and find that there was actually an outburst there. That's not going to happen anymore once this pipeline is up and running. Within 10 minutes of a, an optical rise, we'll, we'll know about it and we'll be able to alert the community and we can start more to wavelength campaigns on the object. So uh, Dan Bramich was working uh, with me for two years. And uh, he's still in Abu Dhabi, but he's working on something else now, and he's finishing this off in his spare time. Uh, we expect the first XB News announcements in the next few months. So we expect maybe one or two per year to go into outbursts, and we should be able to see that before um, the X-ray uh, monitors. The current status of this project is that the <coughs> astrometry is done using Gaia positions. The photometry is done um, via extractor, ap aperture photometry, and PSF. Um, and the flux calibration is done in most filters, but not all of them yet. That's something that needs to be finished um, using the Atlas WebCap 2 catalog, which includes pan stars, um, and then we've got the Y band separately. That's one micron filter, and the APAS catalog um, with these filters. Um, we're currently at the stage where we are writing the alerts code and making <coughs> the web pages with the light curves. So when we detect a new outburst, we will alert the community and trigger on other facilities. We will immediately submit a SWIFT DDT, so it's quite easy to get an X-ray observation with SWIFT. Um, that's fairly deep, it's not the most sensitive X-ray telescope that exists, but it's fairly good to detect the early rise in the X-ray. We also have informal agreements with people, with uh, Astrosat, HXMT, NISA and Interval. These are X-ray telescopes that we basically we say, there's a new outburst, would you like to observe it or not? Um, we're hoping to get radio observations fairly early at the beginning of the stage of the outburst. Uh, Rob Fender at Oxford University has access to the AMI telescope in Meerkat in South Africa. James Miller-Jones has access to um, the VLA, so he's got programs on that, and potentially ATCA and um, LBA in Australia. Um, and Tom Russell in Amsterdam is working on that as well. Um, we might be able to get millimetre observations um, from Alex Tetarenko at the East Asian Observatory in Hawaii and Greg Sivakov at the University of Alberta um, with ALMA or NOEMA or JCMT. And we'll put out an ATEL if we detect a new outburst so anyone can observe this new um, transient. And uh, just this year we were lucky that our Chandra proposal was accepted so we submitted it last year and it wasn't accepted this year it was, which is good because our pipeline's coming online now. Um, so the problem is that we require a very fast trigger with Chandra, which is difficult to get approved. Um, so the idea is that if we detect an optical detection, then we first trigger SWIFT. And if it's detected with SWIFT, we don't need Chandra, so uh, we don't trigger Chandra. If it's not detected by SWIFT, but we get a, a second optical detection that confirms that there's definitely an outburst happening, then we trigger Chandra. And we can get very sensitive X-ray observations right out of quiescence as it's getting uh, brighter. So the disk instability model also predicts that there's a rise um, between outbursts, so this, this slope here. And we do see that in some of our data. So this is a, a black hole x-ray binary. You can see that there, there's a lot of um, variability, but the general trend is that it gets brighter during quiescence between outbursts. And um, the rising trend is seen in some sources, but not in others. Uh, but it's actually shallower than the model prediction and there's more variability than detected as well. So we can study why that is. 
Um, but there are some interesting features like this seems to happen uh, in this particular object. This is a different object where there's a lot of variations but there's a general trend that rises um, be be before an outburst. And this table shows there's only about five systems where the slope between outbursts has been measured so far, but this is going to increase once we've got all of our data um, from the long-term monitoring reduced. And they're on the order of 0.1 or less magnitudes per year rise. And four out of five of these objects are da data taken with our um, telescope monitoring. Uh, but there are some surprises. For example, this particular source before this rise, it was also doing something a bit crazy before that, so there's like a mini outburst here, and that's hard to um, uh, understand in terms of the disk instability model. So the first light curves of our objects using this pipeline are starting to come, come out now. Um, this is the previous observation, previous uh, analysis of GX59-4. This is the XB News data. So the magnitudes agree fairly well, but we can look at why there might be some differences. Probably the XB News uh, are better, more accurate measurements. Uh, this is a uh, system in quiescence called AO620 that's got some flickering during quiescence, and we've got this new light curve of this object. Uh, there's a neutron star, Senex4, which appears to be slightly getting fainter, which is something that's not expected. So this is kind of the first new result we've got from our monitoring. Uh, over 10 years, it seems to be getting slightly fainter. We're not sure why. Um, and another source, V4641, which is a black hole system. Um, this is the <coughs> quiescent level, and it's got some mini outbursts that we detect at different uh, times. So this is just a few examples of the light curves that we're getting out of our pipeline. And um, all of these are going to be publicly, publicly available on our website. Um, in the summer, there was uh, an exciting thing where one of our systems, neutron star system, SACS J808, went into outburst. So this is our light curve. We can see that it's fairly steady. And at this point, it's about a magnitude brighter and flickering around. But it stayed like that for two weeks before it suddenly went into outburst. So just zooming in on that, uh, we spotted this in real time. So we were able to um, alert the community with, an, with a telegram. And there were early Swift, Radio Meerkat, X-ray NICE, uh, New Star, and also optical salt spectra taken um, at this point before the main outburst happened. So this is the first example we've actually had where we can see the beginning stages of an outburst taken with multi-wavelength data before the main rise happens. And we, none of us actually expected this two-week flickering. We don't know why that happened, so um, now we're going to look to the theorists to see what they've got to say about it. Um, but it's actually a longer time scale than we expect because this is quite a short orbital period system. Uh, now we're getting to the stage where we want to um, send automatic alerts to us when a new outburst happens. So there's a student, uh, Sarah Purpoy, who's working on the code for this. And basically, we can take a light curve and we can say, if this is happening in real time, which points would produce an alert that would send us an email and then we can look at the data. So. Um, this is just the first attempt. We've got an alert happening when an outburst happens here and here. Uh, but we've also got some alerts here because there's quite large magnitude changes here. So we can change the parameters to make the alerts happen when we, when we want them to happen. Um, so just one more question. So you yeah. mentioned a number of systems that have been in quiescence for 50 years and others for a month. Yeah. Right? So is there... Um, have you, has there been any kind of fundamental relationship between uh, kind of how often these things happen, outbursts in the kind of systems, or is it kind of more complicated, kind of wavy, disky stuff? Instead of <laughs> yeah, so we do know that um, mm. generally speaking, systems with larger disks should have less frequent outbursts, but it's not always the case. So it depends on the mass accretion rate on, from the companion onto the star. So how much is it filling its roach lobe? Um, it depends on quite a few different parameters, but um, there's some, there's some really nice papers that show in certain diagnostic diagrams how frequent the outburst should be, um, and they seem to agree with the expectations, although there are a few uh, surprises. So from these uh, methods, you can say which ones should be persistent sources and which ones should have outbursts and how regular those outbursts should be. Um, but yeah, there's only maybe um, 30 or so objects where we've got these. And some of our data is going to help in understanding the cadence because um, yeah, there's, there's several outbursts which have happened only once every 10 years or so, so 
we, we can check our light curves to make sure there weren't any uh, in the middle of the quiescent period to measure those cadences better. Um, how long have we got? <coughs> Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. So I'm not <coughs> going to talk about the, the jet side of my talk very much. Um, maybe I can just go forward. So let me just see. Let's go to one interesting result. Um, which is, yeah, let's start here. I put way too many slides in. Uh, right, so during outbursts, we can do some interesting studies of the jets. Um, I mentioned that during the hard state, you have uh, a jet that's always producing synchrotron radiation. We can see that in the uh, infrared light curves as well as our, of our objects. Um, and in the soft state, this jet seems to disappear. Um, this is a, these are light curves of GX59 in the infrared. And you can see in different outbursts, the, the infrared emission is bright, and then suddenly over the transition it gets fainter. And we think that's the jet disappearing. Over here, we've got emission from the accretion disk. Um, and during the second part of the outburst, during the decay, this uh, emission from the jet reappears again. Now, I've always wondered why the, the, the drop and the rise over the state transitions are um, quite prominent in some objects and not very prominent <coughs> in others. So this is a different object, and you can see that during an outburst, there doesn't appear to be a jump over the transition at all. So this is the infrared light curve, and it just decays with a fairly steady slope. So in this source, there's a change of between two and three magnitudes over the transition, and in this source, there's hardly any at all. And we realized that this might be due to um, the infrared emission being beamed towards us. So if this is really synchrotron emission coming from the jet, um, if, it's, if, the, if the emission's beamed towards us, if the Lorentz factor is maybe um, a few or maybe up to 10, then we'd expect much stronger infrared emission. So we made this diagram of the, the flux ratio <coughs> before and after the transition. So how much does the infrared drop or recover over transition versus the inclination angle of the accretion disk? Um, and these lines here represent models for different Lorentz factors. So um, the data kind of agree with the general uh, shape. There's no data in here, which is, which is good. So what are we actually saying here? If we're looking at one of these X-ray binaries and we're looking uh, down the jet axis, then we expect highly beamed emission. Um, so that's a low inclination system and the jet is directly orientated to the line of sight and we'll get a large change in the infrared emission over the transition. If you're looking from high inclination, uh, then the projection surface area of the disk is lower, so the disk is actually fainter. Um, so you can still get jet emission if the Lorentz factor is low. So it's a function of the inclination angle and the Lorentz factor as well. So for, for high inclination systems, you can also have um, quite a big change of the transition just because the disk is fainter, but it only works for low, low Lorentz factor systems. So you're saying at low the Lorentz factor, the jet is not very tightly beamed? Yes. So you see it from the side? Exactly. The Lorentz factor is right there. Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> this um, simple model here can predict that um, there shouldn't be any uh, observations where you have a high amplitude for the infrared change of the transition if the inclination angle is intermediate between these two extremes. And that seems to be what we see. So what we did was we, we trialed different uh, Lorentz factors and just saw if there was a correlation between the expected um, change of the transition and the observed. And for certain values of the Lorentz factor, between about two and four, there, there is a correlation. There's not many data points, I agree, but um, there is a statistically significant correlation for a certain number of uh, trials of Lorentz factor. If we try Lorentz factor one, which is unbeamed, then there doesn't seem to be a correlation at all. So we took it a step further after this, and um, if we assumed that instead of just one value of the Lorentz factor, which is probably quite unrealistic that all the black holes have the same Lorentz factor jets, if we assume that there's a distribution of Lorentz factors which are in a power law, and that's actually been found for AGN, then we can estimate um, the, the distribution, the parent distribution of Lorentz factors, and um, we used a hierarchical Bayesian modeling to get the value for this <coughs> slope of the power law from our um, data. <coughs> Basically, we measure a, a power law distribution of Lorentz factors uh, with a power of minus 1.88 with some error, uh, which corresponds to 
for our systems, a Lorentz factor between about 1.3 and 3.5, and this is work that my postdoc, uh, post Vini Sokia did. So these are histograms <laughs> normalized by the peak of the inferred jet Lorentz factors for each black hole X-ray binary uh, constructed using the um, MCMC um, Bayesian uh, models. And the red line shows the curve which represents the parent distribution, so the power law distribution. Um, and these here show the range of Lorentz factors um, for different probabilities. And uh, the blue is the best fit, and the black dashed lines represent the 16% and 84 percentiles. So we can constrain the Lorentz factor for single objects um, in some way. I mean, not very constrained, and we don't have many objects, but this is a good starting point. And given that there's not many estimates of the Lorentz factor of these jets, um, of the compact jets and X-ray binaries, we think this is a good test that we can do with more data in the future. So as a summary, uh, we can aim to have uh, XB News alerts uh, of new outbursts very soon. And by triggering uh, early on the X-ray, we aim to test predictions for the disk instability model about how outbursts are triggered. We'll also be able to study the early rise phase at all wavelengths to test, for example, correlations between different wavelengths during outbursts. And we're using multi-wavelength campaigns to understand jets and how they're launched. So I haven't talked much about these uh, uh, um, different properties of the jets, but uh, we think that the jets are mildly relativistic, which is similar to what, what we see in AGN. Um, and finally, in the Galaxy Components cluster of our newly created Center for Astroparticle and Planetary Physics, uh, we'll compare the energetic output of X-ray binaries with other galaxy components such as supernovae and AGN, which uh, people like uh, Joseph Gelfand and uh, Injin Zor and Mally Roberts work on. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, so Alice and Steele come online in a couple of years, so I'm wondering what that does to your strategy, like, like how you take advantage of that, how you measure complementary to things yes. that will sweep up. Like how does that change what you're doing with this like really good resource here? Yeah, great question. So um, I was actually worried when, you know, I first think about um, LSST and also ZTF and things like that because I thought maybe they'll just supersede what we're doing. But actually there is there is a bright limit to um, LSST. So <laughs> <laughs> so for, for all the systems that um, go into outbursts. We need to do high cadence monitoring for you know magnitude 16 or brighter systems. So it's still useful to do this with one uh, meter telescopes. We're definitely interested in using uh, LSST to for the fainter systems. So any any objects that are in quiescence that are fainter than magnitude um, 21, 22, uh, we can't do that very easily with our monitoring. And LSST is just going to pick them up whenever they uh, whenever they see it. So we can combine our data. With, um, with LSST data and also uh, ZTF and other surveys. And it's definitely complementary. So with this um, system that we've got, it's, um, it's more powerful in the sense that we can choose when to observe. So we can act in real time on, on, on outbursts and things like that. Um, we can take infrared data if we want infrared data with an infrared telescope. Um, this is optical. And um, one thing I want to do is to check that the filters are the same as LSST, for example. Then we can combine the light curves into one uh, uh, one light curve all the way from the faint stuff to the bright stuff. So I would say they're definitely complementary, and we're going to continue using these telescopes um, into the LSST era, but uh, um, it'd be really useful to, to combine everything together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is the origin of jets understood? Is the origin of jets understood? Uh, yeah, why, why are, what uh, creates these jets? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I'd say for decades, people didn't really know. Um, so 20 years ago, if you asked um, uh, a computer simulation person to um, simulate a jet, they couldn't do it. Now we've got the computational power, and we understand these things a bit better. Um, now jets are being produced in computer simulations. And um, we're getting to the point where we're trying to understand the exact acceleration mechanism and how much power those jets have. And we, there's a lot of parameters involved. There's the opening angle, there's the Lorentz factor, there's the process which accelerates particles, the, what radius does that happen at. Um, from AGM, we've got a lot of clues. So we can zoom in on the, um, on the, on the base of the jet in uh, M87, for example, quite easily now. Um, but uh, in X-ray binaries, what we can do that benefits, um, that's more easy in X-ray binaries compared to AGN, is we can study how jets change as a function of changes in the accretion flow. So we can see what 
what conditions are required for JETS to be launched. And that gives us clues about um, the launching process. So we know that um, it's basically magnetic field lines that are accelerating particles to, um, to high energies. And um, we know how JETS are launched, but we don't know the details. Okay, so we'll have a reception downstairs, um, and let's thank you.